Hi everyone. For this episode, we have the spike protein again of the coronavirus. Uh, so this is you know, part of uh, analyzing the structures uh, that cause COVID-19 in the coronavirus, looking at how they might infect cells and also looking at the latest papers. And this latest paper, which uh, we found, actually shows a few mutational spots on the spike protein, which we've highlighted in a few key areas. Uh, we'll go into these in more detail in a bit. Um, and we'll also show how that binds with the ACE2 uh, cell. So this will be the human cell. Um, and also talk a little bit about the, the fusion mechanism that happens as this is all binding. Yeah, so we have in red highlighted all the mutations that uh, we found on you know, different genomic sequences, different virus isolates uh, through the world. And so this mutation that uh, is very controversial these days, which is located over here, the D614G, something that was found uh, in Europe in early February, and uh, it's been spreading uh, very rapidly. So th this paper claims that this mutation just um, makes the, the virus more transmissible, which um, you know it's very controversial because it's just a computational study and there's a lot of people saying that there's just no proof for that yet. So, you know, let's explore a little bit these uh, mutations. Yeah, um, well, so, so some of the reason that they're saying that this might actually uh, lead to more transmission of the virus uh, is because of the, this hydrogen bond interaction that we see right here, right? So do you want to tell us a little bit more about the mutations? I, I could give you a presenter if you wanted to show anything. Sure. Yeah, so this uh, aspartic acid makes uh, potentially a uh, strong hydrogen bonding with the threonine. So it's important to note that the aspartic acid is located in the S1 uh, unit of the spike protein, whereas so, this threonine is in the S2 unit. And so the S1 and the S2 uh, being this blue region and this uh, gold region over here, right? Correct, from neighboring uh, protomers of the spike, as, as is a trimeric protein. Uh, do you want to zoom out a bit and talk about the, the cleavage uh, action? Uh, sorry, uh, make it smaller. Yeah, so uh, by mutating this uh, aspartic acid to uh, glycine, what happens is that this hydrogen bonding here uh, doesn't exist anymore, meaning that the interaction between the subunits might be a lot weaker, uh, thereby uh, facilitating the shedding of the S1 and S2 subunits. And that's the basis they claim could be um, helping with the transmissibility of the virus. Cool. So just to zoom out a bit. So we have this uh, S1, this entire you know, blue part over here. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have our S2 subunits. And eventually there, there's a cleavage where, where this whole part is, is kind of like coming off. And Correct. If the have, cleavage. If you, if you have a really oh, strong yeah. hydrogen bond here, right, then that means that it might stay on longer and be harder to cleave but if it's easier to cleave then it might um, transmit itself more is the theory Ex it's what they're coming yeah with. so the happens. cleavage site is actually uh, over here it's actually missing from the structure because it couldn't be solved by the cryo mm -hmm. cryptography. so it's right here in this missing this is kind of a gap here you can see the, in the loop yeah yeah but so between it's over these, there. Uh, these two. And so, you know, a gap like this, um, let's just select the residues. Um, so a gap like this, um, you know, there would normally be a few more you know, residues at least. Or, sorry, which yeah. one? Over Should here. be this one here. Yeah, so there are several arginine residues that allows for the host protease to cleave here in the subunit. Yeah, okay. We just have a, a gap in the structure. So b between the, uh, the light blue here and the, the darker blue color, would be a few more amino acid residues that would be easier to cleave. Um, and then we would end up having uh, the cleavage event, which would take off this whole blue part over here. Correct. Then we can go ahead and do a mutation uh, in nano to, to show how uh, by mutating the aspartic acid to uh, glycine, then we don't see uh, hydrogen bonding anymore. Cool. There's also potentially another hydrogen bonding with the phenylalanine up here with uh, this over here. So there could mm -hmm. potentially even be like yeah, two hydrogen bonds that are- Yeah, it's, that are it's so hypothesized. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and so it will if, if we select this um right and then we go over uh to our mutation menu which will yeah up here perfect all right and so now uh you wanted to put it into a uh glycine, glycine. Mm -hmm. all right yeah um you know not really uh much interaction there we don't really have much of a side chain on that yeah so that mutation would um hypothetically supposedly facilitate the shading of the two subunits uh with implications in transmi transmissibility cool um, now there's another implication by the way which uh, also this paper claims which is that this mutation may um trigger an allosteric uh, conformational change that would affect up there. You want to uh, move the protein a little bit. So it could affect the, you know, the bottom and up conformations of this uh, RBD domain. Okay. So that would be an allosteric change because of course it's uh, located down here, the mutation, but it would somehow affect up here. So that's, that's the implication for infectivity as opposed to the implication for transmissibility. Really? With with this one down here, that causes a entire structural change? On yeah, because somehow, yeah, it is connected. And when, when the event of uh, going to, from the bottom, I mean, from the closed to the open state, right? So even mm -hmm. though it is far away, it can still affect the, the entire process. That, that would be an allosteric uh, interaction. And so, yeah, that's what they, this paper uh, suggests. Yeah, I see what you mean. Like maybe you know, if there was some hydrogen bonding, uh, you know, between these two with uh, the previous amino acid, like there'd be less interaction. It would pull less of this down, and then like you know, eventually that would lead to this being you know slightly different in one way or another. Yeah, exactly. So sometimes even if it's not a, a completely uh, close by, it could still affect the entire conformation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So what's up with the, with this one over here? 367 yeah this is another mutation that's just unclear how it would uh, affect if at all the you know the transmissibility of the virus because it's not located in the, the rbd domain it's just way uh down there so it's just unclear as of now what's the implications of that yeah that, that's interesting and I, I think that you know th this paper if we want to just look through um so the data right uh, you know, it, it, this is showing us um, you know, these mutations are from people that have the virus. We you know, sequence uh, the virus uh, from different strains that people have. And you know, by tracking these you know, very specific mutations here, uh, we could track how the virus is moving through different geographic populations. Correct, yeah. And so what this uh, data shows is not necessarily that this mutation uh, provides with more transmissibility. That's the entire controversy here. Mm -hmm. But what it does show is that it's been a lot more successful, but that could be by something called in genetics, uh, the founder effect, or just uh, plain luck. You know, just mm -hmm. this uh, isolate was just luckier and just spread a lot further than the other one. So bottom line, we, we still don't have uh, proof and evidence, laboratory-based evidence that this um, provides with more transmissibility. It's just a computational study. And definitely the title of the paper uh, is a very much of a clickbait, uh, as we discussed before. Yeah, well, just just the title, the title, the title again, right? Really. So the title is yeah. Spike Mutation <laughs> Pipeline. Yeah, that is, this is the spike protein. These are the mutations, all the red areas. Uh, reveals the emergence of a more transmissible form of SARS-CoV-2. And yeah, what I'm saying, like, yeah, how, how do we know that this is more transmissible? Like, how does this necessarily reveal that? And that's the scientific controversy. They show the data. You know, we have, you know, a few key points that, that are very interesting here. Um, but does that necessarily indicate, you know, more transmissible? Nature? Yeah, but what they claim is that by, by this mutation, by uh, making a weaker interaction between these two subunits, it'll facilitate the shedding of the two subunits, meaning that ultimately the virus can be transmitted easier. Yeah, and, and that's um, here in the paper, I guess we just wanted to, to zoom in. That's yeah, down only, here sure. in the, the D yeah. section, yeah. Correct, so yeah. Is, so this is showing that we have a S1, 
Um, so we have you know this S2 in the gold, S1 in the blue. That's that interaction right, right there. And then exactly, we have, yeah. mm -hmm. yep. And then we have the S2 cleavage, uh, which is down here, right? And so this is where the S1, S2 cleavage would be with the light blue and the blue. Correct. So it just would supposedly uh, enhance the shading of the two subunits. Um, so if we look at what what that is. The receptor binding domain is the tip of the spike over here. And so this tip of the spike will actually interact with human cells. And if you just zoom in on that, you actually end up seeing that this is the receptor binding domain. So if I uh, go ahead and select that, uh, display, I'm just going to hide the surface for a second. Um, and then I'm going to do a little alignment. Uh, where's the alpha helix over here? Cool. There you go. Uh, something kind of like that. And so, yeah, the, the big thing is that these structures were resolved in different ways. Uh, the bigger spike was resolved using cryo electron microscopy called cryoEM. And then the smaller, uh, just receptor binding domain and the AC2 was resolved with X ray diffraction. And so, we're going to have a, a lot higher resolution there. So, yeah. So, if you look at it, we have the whole spike coming up, interacting with the human ACE2, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And that's uh, supposedly how the spike gains entry into the cell because the cell lives even past the ACE2, binds with the ACE2 receptor on the surface of the cell, um, and then through a, a mechanism uh, involving the fusion coil, uh, which we could also look at here, Yeah, uh, this, uh, we, we end up yeah. having a big conformational change, this Part starts shutting off. Um, these end up, you know, forming by, uh, you know, straightening up on this alpha helix and that alpha helix. That all straightens up. All these bundles end up fusing together, and uh, then you end up having this big uh, viral fusion event. So if we just zoom in, I'm just going to hide all these other ones, and we're just going to look at the receptor binding domain. So, uh, you know, AC2 receptor here, uh, receptor binding domain. A lot of the interactions are happening, you know, down here, um, different parts, but some of the interactions actually do happen with these loops. And it looks like uh, this one in particular is in a, you know, looks like a very important spot uh, that this would be interacting with just because it is so close on the surface uh, of the AC2. So here's the thing, this paper is controversial, not only about the implications of the title, uh, in the conclusions that they drew according to the data, but also because they mentioned the different strains. And according to other researchers, there's just one strain of the virus. You know, just because we have different mutations within different isolates uh, in different regions, like in China or in Europe or in America, but that doesn't make necessarily uh, a new strain. For it to be a new strain, it needs to be functionally different, which is not being proven yet. Uh, in this case, to, to be the case. So yeah, bottom line, this paper shows a lot of good data. Uh, we are not just sure yet about the conclusions. Well, well when we looked at uh, SARS-CoV-1 versus SARS-CoV-2, huge mutational differences, pretty much like everywhere on the outer surface was mutated. A bunch of different parts of the receptor binding domain up here were mutated. Um, and now we just see the two mutations uh, over here, yeah, one mutation on the side another mutation on the, on the S1 cleavage site, uh, this group of like six yeah. mutations. Like it's not, yeah, it's not a full strain. It's several mutations that we see. Correct, yeah. And most of them might be uh, you know, not really doing anything important, you know, to, to the infectivity or transmissibility. Some may, the most important are the ones, of course, in the binding domain that we discussed earlier and the one down here on the aspartic acid. Down here, cool. yeah. Yep. Awesome. Well, um, yeah. Hopefully, uh, you've all been enjoying this series. Uh, we're trying to you know, get the latest research, the latest uh, information on coronavirus, COVID nineteen, um, and, and just share that with the scientific community, share that with the public, and you know, hopefully, you know, the insights that uh, these papers are showing are much more clear when we do these virtual reality explainers. And uh, you know, keep tuning in the videos. Uh, download Nanom, try it out yourself. You have really amazing software. So yeah, thanks a lot, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.